Hey everybody, welcome to episode 3 of So I've Been Told. Today I'm going to be talking to my good buddy Eric Glendy. He plays in the band The Highest Leviathan. He's played in a bunch of other bands and we're going to dig real deep and talk about that in this episode. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I don't have a whole lot to say. I do want to mention, he, he mentions a band that the name of the band contains a homophobic slur. Um, I don't like that word. Um, then he, he repeats the name several times, so I apologize if you're sensitive to that. Um, it's just the name of the band. But yeah, I'm going to just go right into the uh, interview, and I hope you enjoy it, and I'll talk to you after it's over. All right, we're on. So, Eric Glendy. Hey. Saranac Carmel Porters. Mm. Sitting in the living room on this cold January. It's my birthday. Fuck yeah, it is. So, we are uh, just hanging out. We're going to talk about some shit. Um, so, how did you first get into, you know, punk and metal and, and just kind of underground music like what was your introduction to it i got into the genres themselves when i was um oh geez what 11 years old maybe even 10 and it was honestly by um living at my parents house and having this uh not like the kind of tv that you have to turn the knob yeah and i wouldn't be able to sleep at like midnight and I'd watch Headbangers Ball on MTV too. Nice. And f- discovered a lot of, a lot of artists that spiked my interest. The one I, being that old, the one that I held on to the most was, um, was actually Marilyn Manson. But that that uh, that those 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 were good times. Innocent, bright eyed, and everything is just so great because you're discovering that you can actually like yeah. music that your parents don't play. What what else was where they like playing? What what year is that? What how old are you now? You're I'm 24 now. 24. And so, when you were 10, what year? What, what year were you born? 91. 91. So that would have been like, like 2000, 2000, yeah. 2001. 2001. Yeah. 2002. Um, so who else? Who else were they playing on Headbangers Ball? Oh, uh, I recall seeing a a uh, Iron Maiden video that it was apparently. Um, Apparently it was a new track they put out. I don't quote me on that, but they were they were displaying it as it was like it was a new video, and it had something about uh, I'll I'll fact check that, but it's like the rain rain song or it had to do with like rain. That's all I remember. But that and and then uh, around then Saint Anger by Metallica came out, <laughs> which uh, is definitely not on my radar as a phenomenal album in any sense. But uh, at the time, I certainly enjoyed it, just being new to everything. I actually kind of enjoyed it, too, when it first came out, and I haven't heard it in... Maybe I should go back and listen I, to it. I haven't heard it since, and I have no desire to, to be honest. I, I mean, I, I kind of want to, just out of curiosity. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not, right? Maybe, <laughs> um, maybe we'll get a little nostalgic feeling from yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I actually asked my parents... Well, I... I, I my I asked my parents for Saint Anger for my birthday, and uh, they told um, they told my friends like my my uh, uh, my school buddy told his parents that I wanted that album, but they didn't get it for me. They actually got me a good Metallica album, uh, Injustice for All, which is known to be their last good album. Yeah, before they started getting kind of wimpy, but, uh, that did a lot for me, that really got me into heavier music, good heavier music, not, you know, not, like, Saint Anger, (laughs) so they were looking out for you, yeah, yeah, I don't think they knew better, but (laughs) it worked out in my benefit nonetheless, nice, so how did you, uh, how did you get involved, um, in the local scene, what was the first show, what was the first show you went to? The first show I ever went to was um, Fear Factory in Mastodon. I believe I was 12 years old. 
Nice. And that Did you was... see Mastodon when they came here to Rochester a couple weeks ago? I had a great experience. Uh, I did not get into that show, <laughs> as a matter of fact, but I was next door, and a uh, friend of mine, a couple friends of mine, grew up with Bill from Mastodon. Yeah, because so, he's, he's from the Rot- right, exactly. Rochester area. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so there, there was some... Uh, there were some hangouts afterwards, but nice. I didn't get to see them play. But I did share that with them. That was my first show ever. Then they're like, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fear Factory. Have, have I told you my, my Fear Factory story? Oh, you have a Fear Factory story? Yeah, which oh, they're not a band that I really listen to, but there was a period of time when I was super depressed, and this was pre-Netflix. You know, just living by myself, going to work. I didn't have cable, I just had whatever DVDs I had, so I'd seen them all, because they're my DVDs, and uh, I was watching the uh, the bonus features on the Saw DVD. Oh, and I, before this, I had worked for my grandfather, he's an electrician, mm. and I'd worked at this guy's house, and I remembered the name, Burton Bell. Hmm. And uh, I was watching that DVD, and then there was a, a Fear Factory video on it, I'm like, that's that that's guy! That's the guy! <laughs> He lives in Milton, Pennsylvania, <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I met him. I met him. I didn't, but I didn't know at the time because, like, th- that wasn't really my scene. He's probably okay with that. Yeah, he's he being treated he was, like a normal person. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was super nice. Um, his wife was super nice. They've got a like not an extravagant house, but a like a a beautiful, you know, bigger house. And, I'd say he does well for himself. Yeah, it's, it seems seems like it. His wife's an artist, and I saw some of her art. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was super cool. But anyway, that was a tangent. Sure, a, a worthy tangent nonetheless. Uh, so, yeah, that that was my first show I ever went to, ever, besides going with my father as a little kid. And I can't, I, I don't even know, like, what what concerts those were. But, uh, uh, a mere year later, I actually played my first show at the Penny Arcade. Okay. And, uh, I was, that was with, um, a band called Awake the Hero. Okay. Uh. I'm guessing that was a metalcore band, just by the- It was, no, it was a little bit wimpier than that. We, it was more on the side of, like, screamo-core. Okay. Right. um, I was the youngest member of the band, um, and I played bass for them. And they were just a bunch of kids from my high school. Yeah. My high school at the time. Well, for me, my middle school. Okay. But they were all... Uh, Adrian was our lead singer. He he was actually a senior in high school. Oh, wow. And they approached me just because they figured that I played instruments. And I did. I started guitar at 11, switched yeah. to bass, and then got on the drums. Um. And And just because of, like, what I wore on my sleeves... Like they're like, yeah, he probably plays bass. We'll ask him. And so, because I was, I was, I was all, I was all like weird gothed out. Not even goth in the traditional sense. However, I did seek um, seek out some traditional goth bands. But I'm talking about like the cheesy hot topic kind of yeah, goth. I've seen pictures. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely had some guy liner going on. Uh, definitely was wearing trip pants. I had a him shirt. <laughs> I was really into like the the whole heartogram scene. Uh, I was I was I was a wimp. It was it was real funny. Uh, I I laugh every time I think about it. So they just approached me based on what I was like presenting myself as, yeah. and it ended up working out. I didn't stay with them for too long, because then they realized that oh you're into like Sisters of Mercy and Cold Chamber and Marilyn Manson and we're into like from first to last. <laughs> so. It eventually didn't work, but that was, it was good that that got my feet wet, like playing yeah. a show at 13 years old is a uh, rare, it's a big deal, yeah. especially since it's with, it's act, it was actually with kids that were older than me. Do you know who else was on that show, like what other bands? Or? It was another, that, the, the first one ever was with other bands that were actually from our high school. Okay. I believe one was known as Pelicant, but they changed their name. They changed their name, like, right before the show to... You know, I I, I want to say it right, but I won't even attempt it. However, it was, like, a spoof off of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely okay. Hearts Club. It was something-something Lonely Hearts Club. Yeah. Now, did any of the guys... 
that played in it was Wake the Hero, right? Yeah. Um, any of the guys from that band or any of the other bands that that you played with from your high school to go on to play any bands that, um, you know, still play around here or saw any success or anything like that. Rafael Sanchez moved to Boston. Oh yeah. And he he was our drummer. Okay. And uh, hunting stories is his. Is that what it is? Yeah, Yeah. I was trying to remember, but yeah, I guess he's enjoying what he's doing. But um, also, uh, Adrian, who are who was our singer, I still see him around. I see Mm -hmm. him at uh, Marshall Street, and I know I like I've seen his like Facebook. He's definitely still performing. Yeah, Um, I would imagine uh, near the same genre, but probably a more mature genre in the same you know different floor, same building. Yeah, he he was always pretty crazy about that stuff, but probably better than what than what Awake the Hero was. I I I I will say that in confidence. Now, what's uh what band came next for you after Awake the Hero? Oh, geez. Uh, and did did Awake the Hero record anything? Yes, yes. Apparently, they did. I was not a part of any of those recordings. Okay. Um. They got uh, once we started playing. Once we started playing regularly, mm-hmm. like they got attention, so they were able to like seek out people outside of uh, outside, outside of, of the high school. Yeah. So they they did end up getting like a nice lineup, and and that gave them opportunity to like do a demo. Yeah, I'm assuming you. I could probably look that up on MySpace if I really cared. I'm to. sure you could. I'm not. I'm probably not going to follow through on that. I, but... You know what? I found um, I found my old CD booklet when I was cleaning out my room, my old room at my yeah. parents' house, and and I just found so many treasures. One of them being the Awake the Hero demo, nice, nice, which was an unofficial demo, but I believe that I can't actually remember if the recordings on there are the ones that I was a part of, but they were just attic recordings. It was yeah. nothing like. It was nothing well, serious. It's, it's always awesome to find that stuff. Oh yeah! Like there's so many CDs and 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 stuff that I, you know, not, not even necessarily bands that I played in, but like bands I played with that were were terrible and and mm-hmm. and I'm sure I'd still think they're terrible, but yeah. just for nostalgia's sake, like I wish I would have, like, kept them just just to have them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So what what came next? Um. A band that did not at all receive any attention. <laughs> we were called The Perfect Ending, and that was with my best friend at the time, uh, who went to Finney with me. That was the school we all went to, Charles mm-hmm. Finney Corporate Christian High School. <laughs> it was uh, quite a quite a quite an experience over there. But my best friend at the time, Daniel Hagen, um, I stayed on bass. He was on guitar, and then a friend of ours, Seth, was on drums, and. Uh, but that didn't last for too long, but we did play... Sh- I'm just doing bands that actually made it out live, yeah. you know? Yeah, because, I mean, there's there's an endless amount of things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, the projects that, yeah. like, started and were together for a day. Yeah. But that's that's kind of what I'm interested in. Not necessarily, like, anything that, like, bands that actually play shows and mm-hmm. have recordings. Like, I just want to... I want to document that. I yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. I don't know if you probably didn't listen to the other, the other two episodes. Oh, I've taken a listen. Um, so, yeah, like... This is what it's about. It's about kind of getting geeky and and just talking about things that nobody else cares about, just so it's documented. Oh, great! Okay, and I, I can th- do that. I think that stuff is interesting. I can do and that. Hopefully, other people do too. Yeah, me and Dan Hagen. No, well, with that being said, me and Dan Hagen would just like go and hang out at Sound Source, yeah. not buy anything, just look at all the, just look at everything, like play through amps that we could never afford, and actually like write songs and like. Just really piss them off. <laughs> like these two kids, like they know we're not gonna get anything. These these two kids have been hanging out in the store for three hours now. <laughs> and we bring we'd like bring our girlfriends and shit and like it was so oh, it was oh so dumb. But yeah, we would do that and just like walk around. That was definitely like a friendship band. Yeah. Like we'd just like walk around Cobbs Hill and be like, Hey, do you think we'll be famous one day? <laughs> <laughs> now what's it uh what did the perfect ending sound like, and did you guys play out or record? We never recorded. We did play out. Where'd, um, where'd you play? We actually played at a vineyard church. Okay. With um, a 
It, you know what? It, it was, was it one was of probably the, the Rochester Vineyard that Dorothy was. I, I want to say it was the one over on Winton. It was either on Winton or in Rondequoit somewhere. Okay. There is there is a vineyard church. I want to say that that's the one. Okay, I, I've gone by it before. I'm like, is that the place that I played when I was like 14 years? Yeah. Old? Like, so I, it wasn't the Rochester Vineyard. It wasn't the church that the church building where the playhouse is now. No, 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 okay. no. Okay, no. It was definitely uh, further away from the inner city. Yeah. Uh, for the, for the record, if the, for those of you guys who know, like um, I book shows at the Vineyard Community Space, which is connected to the Vineyard Church, and so that's why I was trying to put all that together, but anyway. Right, um, that show, I believe that was like our only show, mm-hmm. but we did do something else, I'll get to that in a second, um, a, uh, a student teacher at Finney, mm-hmm. I don't remember his name, I can see his face, but I, I, he actually had a band, and he asked us if, like, we wanted to to play there. Oh, wow. It was just, like, the two of us playing. And that was just kind of on a whim on his part as well. He's like, they look like they're in a band. I wonder if they're in a band. Yeah. <laughs> like, so same deal as before, where uh, A Week the Hero approached me. It's just, like, on a whim. Like, this kid looks like he plays music. That's, that's I mean, I've kind of seen how that's how a lot of connections get made, especially when you're young and just mm-hmm. getting involved, is because you don't... It's like this whole new world that you're discovering. Yeah, you don't really and know anybody. You're looking, like um, you know, uh, Tyler Troutman was just on the Loaded Words podcast a couple of weeks ago, and mm. he was talking about the scene where I'm from back in Pennsylvania, how it's always kind of been a couple of years behind, because, um, like, the internet didn't hit there as early as it did other places, so it was... Talking about like just going to the mall and handing out flyers to anybody, yeah, yeah. like anybody who <laughs> anybody looks like, who looks like they'd be like, interested. Anybody in a band T-shirt, he, he even was maybe like, like pick the cutest girls and like throw them a flyer. Yeah, he was like anybody I saw with an asymmetrical haircut, like, <laughs> like just doing whatever we could to like make connections with people who might like understand um, where we're coming from and identify with this like. Um, you know, I know you were talking more about metal and stuff like that, but like, yeah, I definitely all, took all, a big break from metal. It's all, it's all like, it's all punk, like all R- of this right. like, like underground culture and like DIY ethics. Like, uh, you know, I'm gonna use punk as an umbrella term for for all of it because I think it all comes from the same the same place. It's all the same concept. The yeah. genres are completely different. But to umbrella it, like, just a DIY scene yeah. is, it's, you know, like, when you're that young, when you're a teenager, like, that's what you're doing for the most part. It's all yeah. by yourself. Like, no, there's no companies looking to help you out because they don't care. Like, you're yeah. not that good anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, so what, what did that band sound like? The perfect oh, ending. man. It was, it was rock, but it, it was, it definitely had a lot of Me Without You influence, okay. but... Yes. A huge ambience and like just slapped right on the top like yeah. frosting. Um, in no sense would I ever compare us in skill level to me without you. <laughs> you know, we were just kids, but uh, that's definitely how um, Mr. Daniel Hagen was writing the songs. If you ask me, like uh, that we de- we were definitely into uh, Emery okay. then, and me without you, and like you know, uh, we were Christians back then, so mm-hmm. we you know that it was like. The Christian the influence, alternative period, rock. Well, yeah. not late period, because right, Tooth and Nail still doing things, but, but like, um, yeah, that that era of Tooth and Nail bands and, and exactly, Solid State. exactly. Uh, we we uh, now that I'm thinking about it, wow, it's all coming back. Uh, we classified ourselves as an experimental rock band. Nice. <laughs> um, I don't really know what was so experimental and profound about it that we felt we needed to call ourselves that. Yeah, but. For lack of better terminology, we cap term, termed it experimental rock. Okay, and so that that like fizzled out. I'm assuming mm-hmm. just of na- died of natural died causes. of natural causes. Yeah. And uh, what what came next? Ha! Oh man. Uh, oh, what were we called? It was a screamo band. All right. Our biggest influence was Under Oath. It was with some kids I met through the youth group that I was attending. Um, oh goodness, oh man, what were we called? I actually really had fun in that band. Um, I can hear it in my head, our song was called Our Ship's Albatross, 
we started out as Helms of Lee, but then we changed it. Oh, goodness. Hmm. Is this one I may have seen video of? I don't think you... Okay. No, I don't think so. Because I know I saw a video of you playing in, in at, like, Water Street or something like that at some point. That band actually came a little bit later, okay. but we're, we're getting to that okay. point. We're getting to that point. Um, because this is when I was just, I completely had denounced metal for a little while. <laughs> and I was just listening to wimpy stuff. But, um, oh man, what were we called? Started out as Helms of Lee. Well, anyway, that band was pretty much straight up post-hardcore okay. with Screamo influence. Like I said, we our biggest influence was Under Oath, hands down. Um, now, I started out as the guitarist in that band, and then we lost our... we. Well, we never really had a steady drummer, but we l- ended up losing any drummer, mm-hmm. And so, but we still were writing songs, so I would hop behind the drum kit and just play, and our fill-in drummer was, like, outside making a phone call. This was all at my parents' house okay. in the basement. Like Where your parents still live now? They still live there, right over yeah. on Park Ave. Uh, a lot of people who are listening to this probably know exactly what house I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and, and I, so I hop on the kit, and he comes down, his, uh, Spencer Grant was the guitarist, and his older brother was filling in for us on drums, and I'm on the kit, and he comes back down, he's like, what are you guys looking for a drummer for? Like, Glendy's, like, better than any of the fill-ins, including me, that you've had, like, what are you doing? I'm like, huh, epiphany, I should be a drummer. <laughs> So I I started out as a guitarist, ended as the drummer. That was a fun era, but um, that's when I was starting to get into a very interesting, more more mature, interesting music. Uh, for example, say the Mars Volta, mm-hmm. and I started uh, slowly peeling back to heavier music as well. Like I definitely, uh, I'm assuming this is o o five ish. Mm. Oh five, oh six, yeah, around yeah. there, yeah. When Francis the Mute came out, and like exactly. all yep. of us discovered the Mars Volta. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I went uh, D. Laus in the Comatorium yeah. definitely had a huge influence on my writing, and my drum style. He, mm. uh, Thomas Prison, the drummer in that album, is still my biggest inspiration for yeah. drums, hands cool. down, to this day, to this exact moment. Cool. Um, so that okay, so that. Band's name to be uh, never known on this recording uh, fizzled out as well. Uh, now we're kind of up to speed here with what you were mentioning earlier. I got into the hardcore scene mm-hmm. and I was throwing fists, <laughs> and then I had like I was like thinking about what tattoos I was going to cover my body with, even though I was only sixteen. Um, and I was good friends with, oh man, I still, I still miss hanging with him, uh, Adam Delella. He mm-hmm. was real big in the hardcore scene. Okay. We were buddy-buddy, and uh, we started a band called A Martyr's Massacre, okay. which was definitely metalcore, throwdown yeah. kind of kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Um, simultaneously, um, I was literally approached on the beach while I was like with my girlfriend and some of her friends by these uh by these like metal kids, like metal kids, like thrashers. Yeah. And they 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 were in a band called Infernal Abyss. Mhm. And they just they saw I I I had my guitar so they were talking to me about like music and stuff and it turns out like hardcore kids and thrash metal kids and their teens, like, have a lot of similar interests. So yeah. they're like, hey, do you want to play drums for our band? I'm like, oh, okay. So I was in this, like, stupid, like, slam band. But I was also in this, like, very traditional thrash metal band okay. at the same time. And um, A Martyr's Massacre, the, uh, the slam band. I'm just going to call it the slam band because that's right. really funny to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> We actually got Jared um, from Infernal Abyss to come play with us for okay. a little bit. 
which was it it was like it was pretty much a joke to him because he mm-hmm. was into like real traditional metal and like thrash metal. Yeah. So he didn't take it seriously, but mm-hmm. he definitely um was the best guitarist we we knew at the time, so we were happy to have him and, and we just joked around. It wasn't super serious, but we wrote we wrote seriously. Yeah. And that's what I probably saw a video of. That right. is that is exactly okay. I know exactly what video you're talking about. Um that was actually a Water Street battle the band. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That did that band record? Nope, we never recorded. Okay. Infernal Abyss did. Okay. Um Infernal Abyss put out an album, uh, we put out some tracks, it never came together as an album. When my time with Infernal Abyss was over, they got Owen to come in and do drums with them, and then I think with him as the drummer, they put out an album, and it sounded phenomenal. Okay. Yeah. Because I know I'd, I'd heard of Infernal Abyss. Yeah. But um, I didn't, I don't know if I'd... I may have seen them at some point, but it was definitely after you were already out of the band. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, not friends with any of those those guys anymore. But uh, it's important that I keep I, I keep that as a part of my mental history for mm. music because that was the first house show I ever played. Okay, and where what house was that at? It was the uh, Pearl Street uh, Pearl Street like house venue. Okay, right by. Uh, Monroe High, Monroe High. Yeah, um, that's that's not around anymore. Yeah, I heard a lot of stories about that place. What what other bands did you play with there? Uh, Blood Wolf. We okay. played a lot of shows with Blood Wolf, and that's uh, James Von. That's James Von that James Monson's old band, and he's going to come up in a little bit. Actually, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, a lot of out of town bands. We'd actually get to hop on those house shows as well uh, over on Hayward. Uh, a high school buddy of mine had a house over there, okay. uh, and he would also do shows. Uh, Magruder Grind came through, and we played with them. I believe that was my last show with Infernal Abyss, okay. but it was uh, certainly an honor to play with them. Um, other than that, uh, not too many. Uh, well, we did play one year. We played, uh, I'm really proud of this show. With uh, Rabid, Crucifist, and Nunslaughter for okay. Heavy Metal Steve's birthday. Word. Which he also went, he had graduated, but he also went to the same high school with us. Okay. And for uh, for timeline's sake, I was no longer at Charles Finney at this point. Gotcha. I was kicked out for being such a sinner. And uh, I was now attending School Without Walls, which, funny enough, is where everyone from Infernal Abyss went. Yeah. So I transferred over to that school, I show up for class, and I'm like, oh... I'm in a band with all you guys. <laughs> Which I'm assuming it was freezing because it's Rochester. I don't know how you keep warm without the walls. No, oh, God, if I hear that one more time. <laughs> Terrible joke. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm going to grab a real quick here. You know, a water? Oh, no, up here. Oh, yeah, go for it. I'm still working. I, well, I, I'm, you need one? You ready? I'm good at the moment because okay. I, I still had my Dr. Pepper from Moe's. <laughs> So I'm kind of double fisting, which actually, Dr. Pepper and Caramel Porter, I wouldn't like mix them, but like, the flavors kind of are, are nice together going back and forth. I one time had a half a pint of a grapefruit IPA and half a pint of a brown stout and mixed them together and it was the best beer I ever had in my life. Wow. You know yeah. what I've had? Have you ever had Fremois? Nope. It's a lambic beer and it's like a raspberry fra- flavored lambic beer. So there's no hops in it. So it's real, it's, it's it's very fruity. Okay. Um, when I used to live in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, there was a bar that is no longer open, sadly. A real nice beer bar. And is I, that in Lake Linola, Pennsylvania? No. <laughs> no, I've actually never been to Lake Linola, and I don't know which is going to end up on the internet first, the interview with you or the internet with John, but I'm assuming... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure Lake Linola comes up All in right. the interview with John, one way or the other. That definitely, uh, I'll... I'll um... I'll save Lake Linola for his interview. <laughs> but anyway, I would go and I would get a friend of mine, uh, Ryan Byrne, you're probably not listening, but what's up if you are? Um, Hi, Ryan. He, uh, he, he uh, turned me on to Guinness and Fremois, half a pint of Guinness, half a pint of Fremois. Oh, no kidding. And so the raspberry so same idea. and the dark, like, the dark you know, Guinness flavor and the raspberry together is fantastic. Not a fan of Guinness. Not a fan of Guinness. It's not for everybody. I think it's a. I think it's a very piss poor excuse for a stout. All right. Yeah. Just my opinion. 
My brother loved it, but I don't know what was going on in his head half the time. <laughs> Diff- different strokes for different folks. Indeed. So anyway... Where, where were we at before we... Uh, we were talking about the house shows game. with Infernal Abyss. House shows. Um, yeah, I, I eventually uh, parted ways with Infernal Abyss. Then, um, then I was, well, then I was in the scene. I was in the nitty gritty DIY house show scene. Yeah, uh, I kind of was leaving, uh, um, like screamo and uh, slam and hardcore behind. At that point, I had disco- I had rediscovered my love for metal mm-hmm. and uh, and punk. I actually developed a liking for a lot of punk bands at this point, and I was a cruster. I had dreadlocks only on the back of my head. And, um, the rest of my head was shaved and I had patchy clothes and ripped up jeans and combat boots and I looked like hell. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I, I didn't do too, excuse me, I didn't do too much for a couple years after that. Okay. I laid low. I had a band, um... Oh, oh, what came first at this point? A couple years later, so let's fast. Let's fast forward to uh, let's fast forward to nineteen years old. Right. Uh, I had I had some like uh, not up to par bands in between like then and there. Okay. But I don't really even like take note of them. Weird. Um. All right. So here we are. Uh. Two thousand ten ish. Two thousand ten. Two thousand eleven. Okay. Uh, even I'll include 2012 into this whole spectrum here. Uh, somewhere in these years, uh, I started a band called Virulent Rock. Okay, which now is this you after, know about. is this before or after? This is after Sect X. It's right after Sect S. Which we probably should touch on because. Would you like me to? Yeah, just because okay. we hinted at it. I was going to try to ignore it, <laughs> but we'll. Uh, oh, we, okay, we, it did come up yeah, already. Yeah, it wouldn't okay. have come up already. Um, James Von Sin, um, a lot of, a lot of us know who he is, uh, that's all I'll say. Um, I had a friend, Nick Rader, um, he, he happened to live on Park Avenue, and I, I was over on Park Avenue all the time because of my parents, and, uh, we just, like, uh, we literally just, he bummed a cigarette off of me, and we started talking, Mm. and, and, and we both, uh, expressed how we played music and we wanted to start a band and uh we ended up hanging out and like we actually did end up jamming one day mm-hmm. and um he's like oh my friend my friend uh jimmy he's gonna come over and, and throw some vocals on and his buddy andy's gonna come do some bass i'm like all right cool so we'll get a little jam going um i didn't know that the person coming over jimmy was actually James Von Sin, or Reverend Sin, as he likes to be called. Uh, some of us like to call him Big Gay Jimmy. He's not gay, and that offends him, so we call him that. Um, so, that was the same person who I used to play shows with when I was in Infernal Abyss, who fronted mm-hmm. Blood Wolf. Okay. So, oh, no kidding, so now we're jamming. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, we became... A really, really piss poor excuse for a death rock band, and I, oh man, I think this may have been like the worst band I've ever been in in my life. I don't know why I stuck with them for so long. It was probably the fact that we were so noticed because of uh, Jimmy Sin's like social status. Yeah, and that we got like he's attention. An old, he's an older guy. He's an older guy. He's, he's in his he's in his fifties, right? Or, he's not his fifties. Forties, forties. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's been around the scene here in Rochester, um, for a, a super long time. Yeah, I think that's how I always rationalized it. <laughs> um, uh, we did have we have a record. We have a, a EP out. Okay. On vinyl. Um, I don't know if there are any of those around. You know anywhere. what it's called? It, it it was self titled. Okay. Uh, it, it I I I always just kn- knew it to be self titled. Okay. I don't know. If and James you played ever, on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was that. I was the only drummer. Okay. For that band, uh, we never had any lineup change ever. After I I, I ended up quitting. Mm-hmm. 
and then they tried to do more stuff, but uh, I will I will speak uh, highly of myself in this band because I was pretty much the glue holding together all those mm-hmm. pieces of shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I was okay. You know what? I was seventeen. I'm remembering now. I was seventeen, and then eventually it hit me. He's like, "Why are these people in their like late twenties and thirties like?" jamming with the 17 year old and why am I the best musician in this band and uh, I say that with confidence I know that sounds very cocky but it was in fact the case I'll, I'll vouch for him I know him he's okay, a good I, I appreciate it Adam <laughs> <laughs> so that was that that became a disaster eventually however we'll end we'll end that conversation um and this is where I enter the picture yeah yeah that's soon. right that's right um <laughs> uh immediately after that my uh Best friend at the time, uh, Marcus Pitaway. He 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 doesn't go by that name anymore, but that's who he was then. So I'm gonna, sorry, Marcus. I didn't mean to say that name for you. <laughs> um, me and him started Virulent Rot. Um, we were a grindcore band with a ton of um, doom metal stoner yeah. influence. Uh, we were listening to a lot of Electric Wizard, Sleep, uh, Reverend Bazaar, uh, a lot, just a lot of like slow, doomy music, uh, older music, and and newer because Electric Wizard was still putting out. Um, and but we were also listening to um, a lot of black metal and grindcore. Mm-hmm. So to uh, Rodney Christ, who I still love to this day, they they were a they were a big influence in that band. Yeah, Magruder Grind, of course, uh, Napalm Death, uh, Nuclear Assault, which is on the, definitely on the thrashier side of metal, but they they all had influence and in that collected to this band, Virulent Rot. Yeah, um, Resistant Culture actually, I would say, was uh, at the time like I was still listening to a lot of like crust punk as well. So resistant culture. So we we took doom and stoner and mixed it with grindcore and thought that we were doing something special when in all reality it was just a crust punk band. But it was cool. It was I had a lot of fun in that band. Uh, a lot of people still remember those days. Um,
We uh, started... All right, we can start talking about the meat grinder. Yeah. Um, Good times. Great oldies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we played a lot of shows at the meat grinder where uh, Adam lived, and then I also lived. Uh, he lived there longer than I did, but I also did live there. You did. Um, that... That was that was my uh, that was my favorite band at the time that I was in. Up to, uh, my favorite band that I was in, period. At that point, mm-hmm. um, it was just a two piece. It was just me and Marcus. When we first started, though, we did try to have we did try to have a bassist. Didn't work out. It was actually <laughs> you know who it was. It was Spencer Harrington from Keaton. Oh wow, that's yeah, that's really random. He was he was um we we started running the rot. We were known as Skullfuck, and <laughs> Spencer Harrington was dating our our friend at the time. So we were hanging out with him all the time. He's like, hey, you want to come over and like, play some bass with us? And <laughs> and it was fun. It just never worked out. Yeah. And, what's and up, we what's went up, Spencer? Extremely. What's up, Spencer? I, I hope you're listening. I, but we love you. You thought I forgot, man. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, uh, it's just, it's so funny, like, we went in completely opposite directions yeah. music-wise. <laughs> it's funny, though, like, it's, like, say what you want about Keaton or whatever, like, Spencer is, like, such a punk dude, like, it's just who he is, despite the fact that that band is super poppy, like, love you, Spencer. He certainly lives the lifestyle, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I've, I've always been fond of the guy. Yeah, I think one time, one time we got in a fight, and then like the next time I saw him, it was like it never happened. <laughs> he actually he came up. Uh, I did, and uh, I'll, I probably would have already told you about this in the intro to the episode. Those of you who are listening, um, but just the other day, I, my the interview that I did with Loaded Words um, came out, and uh, there's a there, Spencer comes up in that interview. There's a story about the meat grinder. I won't tell it here. I'll just tell you go back listen to the the latest loaded words episode with my, the interview with me and uh check out the the story that Spencer tells. It's, it's give it a listen. It's pretty funny. Um uh, anyway. So Skullfuck yeah, then we, we we changed our name to Virulent Rot. We realized that this is something we really enjoyed and wanted to stick with it. Mm-hmm. We we have an album that uh is sold still I st- believe still sold that um Needle Drop yeah, um, I've seen it recently. Oh, is it still there? Uh, like within the, like, I've been there in so long. Within the know. last year, I've seen it. No there. kidding. All right. So yes, if you if you want to check us out, uh, we're at Needle Drop. Uh, we we actually this is the, the first band that I had merch for, like real legitimate merch. Yeah. We had patches and, and shirts and uh, uh, shout out to uh, Galaxy Graphics for doing that for us uh, on the fly. We tried to have it ready for the Rock Horse Swap Meet, and uh, Chachi drew it up. Real quick, Evan printed it out, and we had it within three days. Like, those guys really pulled through for us. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, I'll always go back to Galaxy. Um, yeah, no, we we, we, um, we eventually just got distracted, and, and, and I started joining a lot of other bands as well. And uh, so, did, so did Locke. He, he, he joined Clam. Which they were they were really cool. That band rules. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think I just because it came up, I'm gonna maybe use that as an, as an excuse to play one of their songs on the podcast. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, if not on this episode, definitely another episode coming up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. Do it. They need to be heard. So you and you guys played a a, a lot of shows here in Rochester. A lot of shows in Rochester, Rochester and out of Rochester, actually. Okay. Um, uh, where else did you guys? Well, I know, I know you played. Where all did you play outside of Rochester? Uh, Buffalo, Erie, and Kingston with with with, with, yeah, with, with Endangered had, Youth, Adam's old band. Yeah, we you know, the, that was the first date of our tour. Right, right. And you guys came out with us, and we played to like another band that was it was like a pop punk band. Like it, it, it was like, it was the Bouncing Souls, pretty much. It, they sounded just like the Bouncing just Souls. Just like the Bouncing Souls. They were from New Jersey. I asked them. Like uh, we talked about the right. Bouncing Souls, and the singer from the band said he didn't know who they were. Who are the Bouncing Souls? I don't know if he what? Was, what? <laughs> I, I don't know if he was just messing with me. I wonder. I wonder. I but never considered that. I can't think of the name of that band. I will look it up 
online on a flyer or something. Yeah, it's will, got uh, somebody. One of us has a flyer for that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you at the end of the episode when I do my corrections and clarifications. What was that place called? The basement. It's called the basement in Kingston, ba- New York. The basement. And uh, it's about an hour up from NYC. Something like that. Yeah, it was close oh, to Poughkeepsie. Close, yeah, it was close to Poughkeepsie. And uh, I remember you guys came out with us, and then you had like you know that's a pretty long drive from Rochester, and I remember we that were was all a long like. Drive. We were just like bummed out that you guys weren't all, like that. We weren't oh, touring together. No, like, I, I we was had so much myself. fun that day. Yeah, we got like we showed up. They had like salads for us. Yeah, like <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, mm. I don't have anything bad to say about about that venue. I mean, it would have been cool if there would have been people there, but they gave us free PBR. Oh, they took care of us and yeah. gave us you know chicken Caesar salads. It was it was nice. Um, yeah, uh, Barnabas. Came along, yeah, for that Barnabas. How you doing, buddy? He was he was on the whole tour with us, actually. Yeah, right. He stuck with you yeah. guys. There's a uh, there's pictures, um, and, and any member of either of that band, uh, Endangered Youth or Variant Rot, and probably Barnabas's personal Facebook. There is a really stupid group picture, the <laughs> about five minutes before we got on the road, leaving the meat grinder. So. That's a funny one if you if y'all want to check maybe, that out. Maybe I'll end up using that as yeah, a go ahead. photo for do the it. for the episode. Do it, do it. Um tell us about what, what we saw at the gas station in Kingston. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Kings Kingston, New York, uh well, let's paint this picture. If you can imagine a really small town like Dansville, but just like urban as fuck. Like, oh my goodness, it's just so urban and and the Culture there is like what you would find in like the inner city, and in no sense do I mean that by race. It was literally just like trashy. Like we were at the gas station after it was right after the show, right? Yeah. Or was it before? I, it, was after, this. it was after. It was after. Okay. It was late. You're right. It was very late. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. It was really late. And this guy rolls up on this like stolen little girl's bike and starts like. Fighting with like a guy on the other side of the gas station who rolled up on a stolen little girl's bike, and, and they're like, "Are you?" It was it was clearly about drugs. Yeah, like like I don't care how they said it. Like it was really obvious. Well, well, the guy was like, "Yo, how many pieces I sell you?" Oh, and then he's and then, like, then he oh, like, pizza." Yeah, he, he hesitated and like looked around. And he's like, "Of uh, pizza, of, of pizza. How many pieces of pizza?" He's like, "Dude, come on." <laughs> You're not fooling anybody. Like, all ten people in this town just heard you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it got, like, it got a little out of hand, though. Like, I, I was, I was kind of, like, at one point, we were just like, yeah, we should we should probably get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> we were, just, we were sitting in the in the van, like, listening to it. I think Eric Freight was pumping gas or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last thing I remember is the one guy's, Lock like... was getting gas, too. I yeah. remember I just, like, stayed in the car. <laughs> and the, the one guy was rolling away, and he just... Kept on, it was like yelling at the guy. He was like, for how long though? <laughs> for how long though? He said it like three times. And that was his response to how many pieces I've sold you of pizza. <laughs> yeah. That was his response. <laughs> Just saying for how long though across the gas station about eight or nine times. <laughs> it was it was amazing. As he's like, as he's like riding away. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what, what, what came next? I mean, you were still living at the Virulent Grinder Rock. when Virulent Rot was over. I remember you guys played a sweet show at Meow House with uh, yeah. Pizza High Five. Pizza High Five and uh, it was either Blackbridge or, or Chillum. Yeah, it was Chillum. Yeah. Or if if they did something in between Blackbridge and Chillum. It, but it was all the same members. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, Grant and Mike. Yeah. Um. Uh, now, I want to say that that was also the, uh, there's, there, there was a band, The Shitty Faggots, and they did an acoustic set. Okay. For I think they did, I got, I got there late and didn't, didn't see them. It, maybe. Um, but I was talking to Teddy from, from Shitty Faggots, uh, the late Shitty Faggots. I'm trying to I'm trying to say shitty faggots as many times as I can. I, I know this. Okay. <laughs> uh, Joey Lanzone mentioned them in in the last episode as well, so they're coming up in two episodes. All right, great. Right. Um, yeah, I was I was with Teddy the other day from the Shitty Faggots, and we were talking about the Shitty Faggots show where 
Virulent Raw and the Shitty Faggots both played a Shitty Faggots show, but it was acoustic Shitty Faggots set. It wasn't full band Shitty Faggots, which just included Teddy and Diggy. Gotcha. But, um, yeah, we were talking, we were trying to figure out if it was Virulent Rot or Sex SS that played, mm. but it was at, we determined it was at Meow House, so it must okay. have been Virulent Okay, I'm Rot. actually putting, uh, no, I'm putting this together because, uh, there was a teen set video. Yeah, yeah, but that was, uh, that wasn't, oh, where was that? No, because Joey, in the last episode, like I said, mentioned the shitty faggots. And mentioned the reason that it is it is the one with the video. So it was on the same. Sh- it wasn't Meow House. It wasn't okay. It, no, it was. It was. I'm pretty sure. Um, I can. I'll, I'll try and do some mm, research. Mm-hmm, and talk mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. But I'm pretty. I'm pretty so sure it was. It was one of the SS and the Shitty Faggots. Yeah. And then um, and I don't know who else was on it, but I know that I'm pretty sure that that was the video that. Uh, that uh, Will Teen set put out. Yeah, yeah, um, right, right. The VHS of so, which was like all no, nobody bought it. No one gave. No one cared. Like, I'm sure there's still copies. Around. There's still there's got to be like tons I think, of copies. I think John W. Kiss probably has one. That's right. He did. If he didn't sell he did him, get he one. Right, because we were when we were living at the meat grinder together for shits and giggles. We would put on that video and yeah. just laugh at how terrible Sect SS was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, now, okay, so, uh, up to speed here, uh, so Variant Rot, we, we, uh, Marcus was looking to move away, and he was doing other things, so, we went out, oh, I just said we went out, we left, we, <laughs> we left each other, we broke up as a band, uh, we remained friends, we were, it was a rough patch in our friendship, to be honest with you, but, um, Bong Slave. Bong Slave. Let's talk about Bong Slave. <laughs> <laughs> you know what um, band I like. Uh, uh, bong, bong Slave. slave. <laughs> that is, uh, that, that's a uh, Bobby T quote right there. Rochesterians. Bobby T from the Bug Bobby Jar. Bobby T, Bug Jar. Great guy. He actually called me on my way over here, Drake, Drake Noto, uh, who is currently in an amazing band called Stragaria. Um, me and him became friends through some other mutual friends of mine that we had, uh, mutual friends of ours, uh, and we started jamming with our uh, Dustin. Mm-hmm. Dustin was our guitarist. And then we were known as Bong Slave. We were a thrash metal band. We kept it pretty ambient, however. There's thra- a lot of thrash parts, but we liked. We also liked to slow it down. Uh, we had... Um, we have no album, but we do have recordings. Mm-hmm. Um, the recordings are from later in that band's career. Career, if you will. Um... When we changed our name, uh, Dustin got kicked out. He he messed up. He he got kicked out. Um, and we met Tyler Stasarowski. Drake was friends with Tyler Stasarowski through the RIT. Yeah, grew like okay. a, a lot of people who I hang out with now. Um, uh, we I I met Tyler, and Tyler became. We just asked him like, "Hey, be our guitarist." He's like, "Yeah." Yeah. <laughs> so then we became Veracult, mm-hmm. which was way better than Bong Slave. Mm-hmm. It was the same band, but it was it was it was way better. Um, those are what you're gonna find recordings of if you if you look for them. Uh, we no physical release, just no physical recorded. release, okay. just yep, just digital. Look it up; it's there. It's on YouTube. Our live okay. show, The Meat Grinders, on YouTube. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm gonna because I don't I don't know if you saw what I do with these two is in the notes, um, I'll have links to, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of things that get mentioned, 
Yeah, sure. So. Um, yeah, that's good. Good on you, Adam. Good, good on you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, eventually, Veracall. It was a, it was very abrupt, but we stopped, and it was within the same phone conversation with uh, Tyler. Uh, Staz, if you will. Uh, I was talking to Staz, and we're like, eh, eh, kind of over it. Kind of done with Veracall. It was a good run. And then within that, he's like, hey, you want to start a band? <laughs> the same phone conversation. And uh, we started uh, a two-piece, um, kind of Russian Circle-y-esque, uh, yet doomy uh, band called The Highest Leviathan. Yeah. And so this was all over kind of the period. This that was the transition from when you were living at the meat grinder to not living at the meat grinder. Right. Yeah. Um, and I I I, uh, I was actually uh, I think I moved back with my parents at that yeah. point. Yeah. And I had moved out. This was well. There was only that month of right. the meat grinder being called the meat grinder the, that I wasn't living there. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, right. 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 Um, the meat grinder was done. Yeah, it had it had it had its its fall for sure. Yeah, the uh, Which, end months there. Was yeah, very, very they're very tough for a lot of us actually. Yeah, it was a we were all uh, even even like aside from the the interpersonal issues that were going on um, within those of us who lived at that house. Uh-huh. Like uh, outside of that, we all had a lot of shit going on in our lives. So it was just oh like, yeah, it, it was, was it was a really dark. We were all like becoming adults and like yeah. accepting responsibility and being so confused. And all of our girlfriends were terrible. <laughs> Yeah, that was oof, that was a dark time. Yeah, the, the, all, all of 2012 was was, oh, like, yeah. was a very rough year, like that whole era. But anyway, so we'd moved on, um, mm-hmm. and Highest Leviathan, your first that was your first show that you played at, the at Rust first House. the first show ever that the Highest Leviathan played was as a two piece, me and Tyler, me and Stavs, and. Uh, it, yeah, you're right. It was at Rust House. Rust House. It was downstairs right. in your apartment with Kaleidoscope, right? Kaleidoscope. Yeah, it, was, it was just the two just bands, us and yeah. um, a couple friends, and it was super fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we talked about that at, at length on the, the last interview. Uh, it? We uh, debuted our first live song. We played it, and like we stopped. It was like people applauded, and and then it was silent for a moment. And Joey Lane's own was just like bawling his eyes out because it, like it just like I guess I guess he really liked it. He, he had a, a <laughs> The hell of a night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks, uh, Joey. Love you, Joey. Love you, bud. Um, Miss you, bud. <laughs> Over there, uh, Buffalo there. Yeah. So, yeah, and then you guys you guys uh, just kind of picked up some members. Yeah, we just kind of kept going for well, um, almost a year, shy mm-hmm. of a year, and then uh, we decided we wanted to be heavier. Mm-hmm. We actually took a Veracult song and made it a Highest Leviathan okay. song, with Drake's permission, of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, Swamp came along. Mm-hmm. Swamp came along, and uh, Swamp lived with Staz over by the airport where we were practicing at that point. Mm-hmm. Um I, I'll be honest, I was not crazy about... Uh, Switching from uh, two piece to three piece, I didn't think we needed a vocalist. I didn't think that even if we got a vocalist, that it should be Swamp. Oh, how wrong was I? <laughs> we our sound now is is I love it. I it's 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 something that tickles my fancy from time to time. I never get bored with it. Well, I, I get bored sometimes because I sometimes I just want to play fast and it's mostly slow. Mm-hmm. But I've found ways around that. Yeah. So um, we have we do have an album out. We are still we are. This is my current band. We're still a band. Um, I will also mention this now before it's ex- before it's completely excluded. Um, during the earlier stages of the Highest Leviathan, I was also in Cheek and the Wolves. 
I, I totally talk, forgot about got, Cheeky and the Wolves somehow. Oh, how could you forget about Cheeky? Well, I mean, not Wolves. like in general. You're but interviewing like, John later. Within this within this conversation, <laughs> I totally forgot about that. So yeah, talk about that band because um, yeah, I'll definitely interrupt this uh, high school fights and sap story <laughs> to uh, bring in Cheeky and the Wolves. Um, Cheeky and the Wolves was uh, my uh, oh. Uh, it was a way for me to still hold on to like punk and surf rock and like, and um, any other kind of genre that I was really I felt like I was leaving behind by diving into a uh, slow doomy metal. And we played surf rock. I was the uh, lead guitarist and the vocalist. John W. Kiss the Third, one of our former roommates, and your. Based former former youth. bandmate in Endangered Youth. Um, he played bass, and then our friend Stephanie, she, formerly of Love Tunnels, formerly of Love Tunnels with uh, Crystal McLean and Tierney Deegan, also known as Turd. Hey, Tierney. Um, they, I guess, Love Tunnels was kind of on the fritz, and me and John were trying to start... Um, Something like fun, something, something really like jumpy, edgy, and but still like punk, still rock. Um, our biggest influence actually being a local band, Triglacticon, mm -hmm. who they don't play anymore, but they played for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, they played it well. They played a show in Portland, I guess. Oh, cool! Recently. Oh wow! So yeah, that yeah. Was like, that band? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, I want to say that Diggy's over there. Okay, because I don't, I don't like personally know anybody from that band, but I've seen them play. Shane's still around. I see Shane all the time. Shane was their guitarist. Mm -hmm. um, Diggy was their other guitarist, but he played a lower, less tone guitar, mm -hmm. so it acted as rhythm. Okay, but it was so melodic that there, it was. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to check them out. Check out Triglacticon. They definitely spurheaded and inspired us like to create Cheek of the Wolves. Mm -hmm. Uh, we definitely had more of a surfy feel, but it was definitely very sporadic, uh, complicated, yeah. um, interesting riffs, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily catchy, per se, but interesting. Um, that was one of the funnest bands I've ever been in. It was one of the most fun bands to see live. We got to the point, it was a slow start, but we did get to the point where we would like really get the crowd going. Yeah, no, it, like, every time I saw you guys, and I feel like, um, you were, it was maybe, as far as accessibility, like, you had a wider audience than any of your oh, yeah. previous bands? Oh, yeah. Um, um, definitely the most broad, yeah. in, in terms of, uh, fans. And you guys, you guys played some super amazing shows, I mean, I'm thinking of, uh... Black Bandit and the Stick Ups release show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Black Bandit. I didn't think I didn't think I did that well personally that show, but that was a fun show. The, the whole room was that was at a place called Panda Man, which that's that's a whole other story. We won't even have to go there. No, we're not gonna. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, the whole crowd was dancing. You guys played uh, AK, also known as Black Bandit and the Stick Ups. Great guy. Awesome. I would, AK, let's get you on here sometime. Mm -hmm. I know we talked about it on New Year's. Um, and uh, who else? The Pickpockets. Oh, that's right. And maybe yeah, another yeah. band, but everybody on that, that lineup was just stacked. Mm -hmm. It was great. Um, and you guys, you played with some other really cool touring bands, didn't you? You played with Diarrhea Planet? It's Diarrhea Planet. Um, that's actually the show I was thinking of where I wasn't pleased okay. with myself, but uh, it's neither here or there. Yeah. Um... However, those house shows that... Sorry, Mom and Dad, but while I was watching the house while you guys were away, I definitely had punk shows in the basement. <laughs> uh, we played with Flip Shit down there yeah. and uh, King Vitamin. Surprise King Vitamin set at the end of the night. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that, that, was, that was an awesome show. That was so much fun. Super fun. I had just packed 50 people in my parents' basement. Um... Was it Hank and Cupcakes? They played a bug jar that night and stopped over. No, it wasn't Hank and Cupcakes. Hank and was... Cupcakes, who was it? Oh, oh, the Rice Cakes. Rise and the Rice Cakes. Yeah, the and, Rice uh, Cakes from New Jersey. And that was, that show was with 
Laura Stevenson and the Cans. Yeah, yeah. And Condition Oakland was on that show. Yes. And so after that... Pretty much everybody just came over. Yeah, after, <laughs> after the Punk Jar show, we all, like, you know, so Tyler from Condition Oakland, mm-hmm. and all of the Rice Cakes, like, we yeah. all ended up coming over to that show, and it was super fun because I know Steph knows the Rice Cakes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so... Getting the, like, be like, okay, like, you played a bug jar show, like, that's one side of Rochester, but, like, this is the other, this is another Here's side. Here's the other side. Yeah. And just, there was a, such a fun vibe. Yeah. That um, night. Flip Shit did all, also did, like, phenomenal. I'll, I'll always talk highly of uh, Flip Shit, uh, Trevor Lake. Yeah. And, and the, the younger lakes uh, of, <laughs> Trevor of House Lake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he's always impressed me as a musician, so I'm always happy to, uh, share the stage with him any night. But, um, yeah, Cheek and the Wolves never really ended. We, we get together sometimes, though it's very difficult because Steph moved to Georgia and Johnny Sunshine's down in Asheville. So. Yeah. That's kind of a bummer. <laughs> John being like one of my closest friends, it's hard not having him around sometimes. But well, you'll be talking to him later. I will. You let him know I say hello. I will. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So so then and highest Leviathan is the current thing you're doing. Um, where can where can people find that album? It's it's on Bandcamp, correct? Yep, we have a digital release out. Um, no, we intended to put it on vinyl, mm-hmm. but, you know, four tracks, like four and a half, I should say, with the, uh, with everything extra, um, that f- being an hour long doesn't transfer to vinyl very well. <laughs> and it's super expensive. Yeah, you need, you need, you're going, you're talking like 180 gram and your volume's going to be low and... So we have that. We're we're seeing about figuring that out. Uh, but it is released digitally. It's on our Bandcamp, uh, the High Leviathan's Bandcamp, and uh, we are actually writing new material right now. Cool. And we have not written new material in a while, but we are doing it, and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. Awesome. Which I'm really happy to say. Yeah, I uh, I, I like your band a lot. I appreciate that. Um. I know Tyler. I, don't, I think Tyler Staz doesn't think I like you guys because he knows I'm not like I'm not generally like a metal guy. Um, and we don't he, consider ourselves to be a metal band. Yeah, um, but I mean, he was just like one night. He was just like, man. He's like, I know you like that old stuff, which I I did, um, but I like the new stuff too. I I, I do wish you would uh, have. Like a release of some of those old songs when you were more like Russian Circle. Okay, well, I'll yeah. let you in on a little secret, Adam, and everyone listening. Uh, we are writing a song right now that is based off a riff that me and Staz wrote when we were still a two piece improv band. Yeah. So nice. we are taking an old riff and making cool. it a song right now. Yeah. Nice. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. You're going to have to <laughs> buckle up and, and come along for the ride if you want to hear the end of that story. But, um, no, I'm having a lot of fun writing, especially since it's it's with an older riff. Yeah, it's, and it seems like you guys are getting some, some attention. People around here like you guys. I saw we're, you we're starting to get a good amount of, just, like, followers. We just featured in that Noisy article. Yep, uh, that, uh, uh, Noisy uh, affiliated with Vice, if I'm not... Yeah, and uh, um, Alex Jones yeah, 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 yeah. wrote Alex the article. Jones, Alex Jones of Drews, who um, hopefully will be on the show at some point soon. Uh, but yeah, like that, I was super excited to see you guys got included on that. I, I was excited about that article in general because I'm, I'm buddies with Alex. And, yeah, yeah. No, um, I, I actually was like stoked when I saw the article. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I definitely want to read this. Like, yeah. And then I'm like, oh man, I'm in this article. <laughs> so you didn't know? You didn't know? I had no idea. Yeah, that's no, awesome. no, we, that's had, even we cool. had no indication that uh, that we are a part of that. But, yeah. Um, I thought that crossed my mind. It's like, oh man, I wish they asked if uh, we could have been in this. We kind of would f- like definitely fit like what the concept here is musically. And I just like scroll around. I'm like, oh, they yeah. just went ahead and did it. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, real quick, just to complete the timeline here, uh, 
during uh, the earlier stages of Highs of Highs and along with Cheek and the Wolves, I was in the Bygone Few, who is still a band. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was also the final drummer of Abandoned Buildings Club, mm-hmm. who uh, Sean and Dan went on to create King Buffalo. So uh, the only reason I mention that is because, first of all... Well, they're still active, so... Well, Abandoned Buildings Club is not oh, active. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, Bygone Few is active, so definitely check them out. It's uh, straight-up rock and roll. It's... Um, it's fun. It's it's bouncy. It's edgy. It's it's great. Uh, very good friends with uh, the Hurley couple, Ryan and Alicia. I I hope one day to have a marriage like theirs. Um, but also with Abandoned Billings Club, that was most certainly the like grooviest and fun to play live band because there's so much buzz for us Mm. and every show was just an awesome time yeah every time I saw you like I almost saw you a couple times but there was always good turnouts at those shows always a good turnout and yep people were super into it because it's you know it's like psychedelic rock yeah like no one really dislikes that (laughs) like yeah there's groove and you stick in the pocket and and oh oh, hey they have two drummers simultaneously can't really go wrong there yeah but Yep, uh, we uh, we all parted ways. Uh, King Buffalo was started, but that is definitely notable. Um, we do have we did release an album. Um, it's more so an EP, but it's long enough to be a full length. ABC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's available on Bandcamp as well. Uh, definitely check that out. Bygone Few does not have any releases with me on it. I am not sure if they have put out. Anything since. Okay. But here we are. I'm in the highs of life, and I'm very happy. Looking to start, uh, looking to uh, attempt to start another uh, ambient black metal band, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, though that's that's my looking into the future. That's something I'd like to do. Cool. Nice. But, yeah. Uh, I always wonder about if I had a. Uh, if I had ever moved out of Rochester, if I'd mm-hmm. still have the same, uh, like, notches on my belt. Yeah, man. I've been born and raised Rochesterian. Played in a lot of really cool bands, and uh, played, and along with that, played with a lot of really cool bands from outside of Rochester, and... Yeah. Man, like, that, that, that article, too, that, bringing it back to that, like, just seeing, like, there's so many bands doing cool things here, and that was just focused on, like the heavy music scene Mm -hmm. and kind of a wide range of of heavy bands featured in that article. Appropriately named, like, the noisy bands. Yeah. Because, get it? Noisy. Hey. (laughs) Uh, Um, No, and and Thop Tongue from Buffalo, uh, Dan Drexel's black metal band, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of theirs, and it was just, even, even, even like, the fact that we were, like, mentioned with them, like, uh, friends of ours from another city. Yeah. Like, it it is, yeah, definitely props to uh, Noisy for, including us in that we're, we're really happy about that thank you any uh i mean i guess we'll wrap it up we're over an hour we can wrap it up sure. pretty pretty packed hour of information um what's uh in, any you know any final final words or things you want to plug or you know whatever sure um, aspiring musicians um people looking to not necessarily be famous but share their music with the world do what you want to do. Like, don't ever... I, this may sound cliche. It's not supposed to be. Don't sell out. What's more important is making connections, networking, and always being nice to your fans. I understand that it can certainly be a hassle. At After a show, you're probably pretty beat. You're probably, like, looking to just kind of like go go to bed a lot of the time and people will come up to you if they really enjoyed it and they'll like try to have a conversation with you which is awesome be nice to them because you will be irritable sometimes some nights you will be like kind of off your rocker because there's so much going on that's the most important moment of the show not your set interacting with people Afterwards, and just networking and and getting yourself out there and being confident in what you're doing. That's most important if you're looking to share your music. 
So keep that in mind. It's not about, oh, we got to get signed to this record label or, or oh, we're only going to play shows with, uh, with really well-known bands because, you know, we, we deserve that. It's like, you don't deserve shit. You, we're all starting from the bottom here. And network. Get yourself out there on your own. That's really important. Fame is pretty much worthless if you if you don't network and and really give your fans a positive image of yourself personally. Other than that, I think we're all doing great. I'm very happy to be in the Rochester music scene. Yeah. Literally from my younger years. Yeah. Like I was I was saying earlier, there's there's something special here. Mm-hmm. Um so well, it's been great having this conversation with well, thanks you. thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been good friends for a long time, so... Yes, yes, sir. So cheers to friendship and to music and all that other shit. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Eric Glendy. The uh, music that you heard in today's show was Rotten Tooth by Virulent Rot. That was a from a live video at the Meat Grinder. You also heard a clip of Keg Stand Sacrifice by Bong Slave, also at the Meat Grinder. And the last song you heard was Sidewalk Surf to Hell by Chica and the Wolves. That was live at the Vineyard Community Space. Uh... Eric's been in a lot of bands. If you check the notes, I linked a whole bunch of them. There's lots of things for you to check out if you're interested. So go ahead and do that and check out The Highest Leviathan. They're super awesome. And shout out to Podcast of Pennsylvania for uh, hosting my show. They're doing some really cool stuff over there. Check it out. As I mentioned, I mentioned in the interview that I'm on the latest Loaded Words podcast. Those guys interview me. On this show, I try to keep it about the guest i know there's been a lot of crossover with these good friends of mine that have been in my life for a long time but generally i want i want these episodes to be about them and not about me so if you're more interested in hearing my story that's where you can find it you can look us up on look up podcast of pennsylvania on itunes and you can find us there or on podbean Um, i guess if you're listening you've already found us so but tell a friend where they can find us Uh, I think that's all I have for you. That last episode was recorded. This episode was recorded on my birthday, so it was last week. And later on that day, I sat down and 
through the magic of the internet, had a conversation with my good buddy John W. Kiss of Endangered Youth and Chica and the Wolves and a lot of other bands. We do a similar thing to what I did with Eric and just go real far back and talk about all of his past endeavors musically. So I can't wait to get that out to you next week. And in the meantime, thanks so much for supporting the show. This is a lot of fun. I uh, can't wait to bring you lots more cool conversations in 2016. Later, everybody.